Hey, how's it going? This is Gazelig for GrinderScore.com. Here today with episode 11 of my How to Master MTT series. Uh, today we're going to cover final table play. Uh, I'm going to go through today uh, what you should do before you actually reach the final table. Uh, we're going to look at the ICM Nash calculator. Um, and then we're going to look at how payouts can affect um, your opponent's play and your own. Um, and then I'm going to give you... Um, a general guide, I guess, um, on how to play the various stack sizes once you reach the final table. So we'll look at the short stack, resteal stack, average stack, and a big stack. Uh, I've included on this uh, right-hand side um, an example payout. Um, so as you can see, um, the top three prizes um, is where most of the most of the money is, and you, you can still make the final table and go home with just ten dollars uh, more than. Uh, if you'd bubbled the final table, um, so you know we're we're doing our best uh, to to make as much money as possible, and we should be shooting for for uh, for the highest positions uh, that we possibly can do. And hopefully um, today I'll be able to show you um, some ways in which we can uh, we can get there, some strategies for you. So before you reach the final table, once you're down to say th the last three or four tables, it's really really important that you observe all of your opponents. So open up um, the remaining tables. Um, I used to just have, when we were down to the last two tables, I'd open up the other table. Um, but it's really good just to um, really focus your game um, and focus your attentions on the last um, four tables, if you can. Last three or four tables. So get them open um, whilst you're observing the play at your table. See if you can pick up anything um, on the other tables as well. So how often um, your opponents are raising, uh, what their three betting tendencies are, um, hands that they take to showdown. So... Um, the ways in which they play certain hands. I mean, if you can uh, find hands that go to showdown, um, that's going to make your life easier because it gives you a better idea of how how they're playing uh, before you face them at the final table. Um, and maybe you can spot some noticeable weaknesses, um, like some players even um, close to the final table are still choosing to limp. Um, uh, maybe they're doing it with a big hand and it'd be good to know that, um, but sometimes you might find them just limping because they don't really know how else to play. And also the final point then, check out their results, uh, all your players' uh, opponents' results, all the players left in the tournament. Uh, check out their uh, stats on Shartscope or uh, official poker rankings, um, just to find out what their average buy-in is, how many tournaments they've played, so what sort of experience they've had, um, and what their ROI is, their return on investment, um, You know whether they're a solid winning player or over a decent sample, or perhaps they have uh, very little experience, they've only played um, a few few MTTs, that sort of thing. Okay, so that's really, really important to do before you actually even reach the final table. So you go into the final table with a much better idea um, of what your opponent's intentions might be at the final table and how they might approach the final table. Um, so here's um, the ICM, uh, a bit about ICM Nash Calculator. Uh, we talked about this before um, from a uh, chip perspective. Um, way to make um, the most chips in terms of shoving and, and calling shoves and it was the equilibrium solutions that we we looked at um, now we this one at the final table is slightly different because you can actually uh, rather than putting in um, the prize pool just to be a hundred percent so you're just looking at uh, ship equity you can actually look at dollar equity by um, selecting um, on this website listed here uh, actually selecting the various payouts for each position um, now I'm not uh, say, suggesting that you should try and use this in game. Uh, I don't know if some sites would actually allow it, um, but it's something to work on away from the table to get a better idea of what your shoving calling ranges should be um, at a final table. And you'll find that they're much much different um, from uh, compared to the early episodes that I've done uh, on shoving, uh, especially in my short series as well uh, on short stack strategy, where the range is going to be much, much, um, can be much, much wider for, for calling. Um, but you'll find at the final table, uh, play tends to tighten up and it should do it as uh, money starts to, to matter more uh, rather than the number of chips you have. Um, so uh, there are some limitations. It doesn't take into account um, relative skill level, like whether you're better or worse than your opponents. Um, if you've got a really big skill Level, um, skill edge on your opponents and it doesn't make sense to um, be getting into a uh, push fold uh, game against these these players uh, you should be looking uh, if you've got a big enough stack to play post flop and to outplay your opponents um, 
And then you can also use sit and go wizard and I'll show you that now. So if I just show you really quickly then, um, this is Holden Resources. Um, now I've actually taken um, a particular hand and it's, uh, this is, I think the structure for a, for a 180 man. Uh, you'll notice that the stack sizes are much uh, larger than it would be in a 180 man. Um, this is just for ease of, of showing you um, how to do it. And 180 man is also one of the options on Sit and Go Wizard, and you can click a button that says Send to Nash Calculator, and it makes it really, really easy to um, to do all of these things. But you can actually just put in the structure for yourself, the current level, how many players are left, and then all the stack sizes, and it will spit out um, the equilibrium solutions for you. Um, so. Uh, as you can see, um, given an idea of the ranges uh, that we should be pushing. So if we were this guy with 392,000 chips, uh, we should be shoving with this range of hands. Now, that's not to say that this is the optimum way to play it. Um, it's just an equilib equilibrium solution. You'll notice that if the under the gun player, a uh, player with the most chips at the table shoves, um, the other stacks at the table should have a really, really tight range for calling. Um, so you see jacks plus, tens plus, ace king suited, jacks plus, jacks plus. Uh, it gets a bit wider as we come around to the big blind, nines plus. Okay. Um, now, if I said that we were on the cutoff, um, we were this short stack here, 85,000 chips, um, then we can go and we can see that it's 28.2% um, of hands that we should be uh, pushing at that point. And we can go down and we can have a look. And see, okay, so it's pocket twos, ace tens, ace two suited plus ace seven off suit, etc., etc. Okay, um, this is um, bearing in mind then that uh, the uh, players behind you are going to be calling with this tighter range. Now, you can't always rely on this. Um, this is where um, some limitations of uh, ICM will come into into play. In that you you don't you can't predict that your opponents are going to be able to play um, like this. They might call looser. They might call tighter. Um, but this gives you a, a good idea, a good starting point um, for the range of hands that you can shove in this spot. Um, I can show you exactly the same situation in the Sit and Go Wizard. Um, here it is, a particular hand with Jack Nine suited. Um, I, this is one of the examples later on in this episode. Um, and this is suggesting from this position that we shove with 79.8% of hands. Um, now, with our particular hand here with jack nine suited and uh, the difference is 0.37 percent now if i just bring in a calculator quickly um this this is a let's just say this was a 180 man and it was there were 738 dollars in the pot and this this move over time um would net you uh 0.37 percent of the prize pool so that works out to be two dollars and seventy three cents. Now you might think this is not um, a massive amount, um, but let's say, for example, you were playing a lot of turbo tournaments. You might play a hundred um, turbo one eighties in a day. Um, this turns out to be quite, you know, can be quite substantial um, for you. Okay. Um, so that's just an idea. Um, that's just the tools available for working out uh, correct shoves when short stacked um, at the final table. Uh, I think you can on Sit and Go Wizard change the structure as well. Uh, I haven't for this. I've just left it as this uh, this standard default 180 man here. Um, but you can you can change that. All right. Um, right. Next one then. So looking at the payouts then. Um, I think it's really, really important to compare the payouts to your opponent's experience and average buy-in. Um, so if you've got a table full of experienced players um, and the only amount of money that's going to matter to them are maybe the top three places, then you can expect them not to be tightening up. Um, you can be expecting them to play quite aggressively um, and try to move up the uh, payload to buy um eliminating opponents. Whereas the weaker, more experienced, uh, inexperienced players might tighten up to move up the pay ladder um, as the money they, they can win just by moving up one or two places um, is, is quite a lot compared to their bankroll um, and their average buy-in. You know, if they're playing a, an average buy-in of $2, um, let's say that their bankroll is 
I don't know, $400, say. Um, and seventh place is $500. And ninth place is, let's say, $300. Um, you know, they can, uh, they might, you might find that they tighten up in order to, to make a little bit of extra money. Um, and finally, final point there, regs are likely to adjust to this and exploit these uh, these weak, tight opponents. Um, so that's something else to, to think about as well, to see the, the makeup of the table that you're that you're playing at. So it's really important um, using the tools then, um, like Sharkscope, uh, OPR, and comparing it to the payouts and, and see what you think your uh, opponent's intentions might be. So with a short stack then, uh, let's move on really quickly then to the strategies of uh, various stack sizes. So with a short stack, 15 uh, BBs or less, uh, our main move is to shove all in. Uh, what we should be aiming to do is to target more conservative players. And by this, um, what I mean um, is medium-sized stacks, um, especially when they're in the blinds, and also players looking to move up the pay ladder. Um, so I gave you the example of the Jack-9 suited. Um, we can show you that here. Um, so you can see Jack-9 suited. Uh, we're in the cutoff here, um, and the players behind us uh, sort of medium, medium size stacks. There's a big stack here, um, but we are the we have the fewest chips at the table. So we want to be thinking in terms um, of uh, make uh, any opportunities we can get to to make chips um, or to win chips. So this is it seems like a perfect opportunity. Um, the players behind us are not going to be able to call us particularly light because um, our stack is a really healthy chunk of their stack. So they're going to tighten up their ranges, uh, which means that we can widen ours. And Jack Nine suited uh, is perfectly um, good to be to be getting in here, um, as we saw in the uh, ICM Nash calculator online and in Sit and Go Wizard. Uh, also, we should adjust uh, our shoving range based on the perceived calling range of of our opponents. Um, so let me just find the example here. Uh, it's Jack 10 suited. Okay, um, so here we are again. Um, we're this time on the button um, with say 16, 17 big blind stack. Now if we, um, you can see that there's a short stack here, five big blind stacks, so it's likely that he'll be getting it in in the next, uh, in the next hand. Uh, it might be eliminated, so that might give us more of a reason um, to fold in this particular spot. Um, the other reason why we might choose to fold in this particular spot is the, the presence of two very, very big stacks to our um, left, um, so who can easily call us with a very wide range, uh, which means that we need to um, tighten up our range for, for shoving here. Uh, it might actually be with 17 big blinds, um, a good spot just to uh, min raise um, rather than commit our full stack. Uh, this at this stage, uh, there is another player here with fewer chips than us as well. Um, so that's just just something to consider: is that we, with with uh, very big stacks behind us, we need to adjust um, because they could be calling with uh, a much wider range. If we had, um, let's say, uh, this guy, and uh, and let's say, yeah, these two players in the in the blinds. Uh, this would be a perfect opportunity to to shovel the, the chips in and put pressure on, especially with the the presence of a very short stack here. Right, re-steal stack strategy then. Uh, say sixteen to twenty-two big blinds. It could be a little bit higher, um, up to say twenty-four big blinds. We should be targeting uh, twenty to thirty-five big blind stacks. Again, the main uh, focus of this episode is to put pressure on opponents that um, will find it difficult to to call. Um, so we should be uh, looking to to target opponents where our stack is going to um, severely dent their stack and their hopes in the tournament. Um, so this hand then ace ten suited. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, um, this particular spot. Um, the button decides to to raise here. Um, we have less than twenty bigs, uh, so definitely a re steal stack. A very uh, in this particular spot. Um, a great hand to three bet shove. Um, and if you think about it as well, 581,000 chips into his stack. 
Um, you know, he's a massive, massive chunk. Um, if he calls and loses, then he's going to be down to about seven big blinds. Uh, so it's a really, really good spot for us um, to pick up those chips, especially if we feel that this player is uh, genuinely stealing. And uh, that brings us on to the next, my next point, uh, which is aim to re-steal versus stealers. Um, and what that, what this means is, if just because a player is in um, late position doesn't necessarily mean that he is trying to steal. Uh, you know, we can look at our opponent's attempt to steal stat on our HUD, um, but this won't always to give us the uh, full picture. And what I mean by that is, this player may have tried to exploit the final table bubble. Uh, you may have played hands with this player um, before uh, in a different tournament, different stage of the tournament, maybe not a final final table. Um, and his attempt to steal stat might be really, really high, but that doesn't mean suddenly then that he's going to be um, definitely looking to steal every opportunity uh, or as widely at the final table, um, especially as in this example, uh, with the presence of uh, some short stacks behind. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, also, if we can find a player who has a really wide opening range, but a tight calling range, um, then we can look to, to re-steal versus them as well. Uh, this next point, avoid big stacks as you have less fold equity. Uh, once again, uh, just reiterating the point before uh, that we should be looking to um, put a severe dent in our opponent's stack if he does choose to call uh, and lose. Uh, so if we are looking to re-steal, we should avoid the big stacks because they can easily call us off um, lighter, uh, which means that then we need a better hand to be three betting. Um, we'd be three betting there for, for value. Um, so let's find this 6-3 suited hand. Okay, this is a particular spot then. So this uh, just over min raises it. Uh, we have about 16 big blinds. Um, two things here. I mean, the hand is just really, really rubbish. Um, not the not the, the hand that I would choose to, uh, to three bet shove in this spot. Um, and also, if we did think that this player's range was, was really, really wide, um, and we thought that his calling range was was really tight. Then it you know it could possibly be uh, an opportunity um, to shove you know almost any two cards. The thing is that if we shove and he calls, um, he's still going to be the biggest, uh, still have the chip lead, um, but he's got an opportunity to knock us out um, and move everybody up the uh, up the pay, uh, pay scale. So um, this particular spot, you should be looking to put pressure on opponents who have, say, a similar size stack or just a little bit bigger. Um, so perhaps if this Nachko guy decides to, to raise, um, I could shove uh, with a, I mean, a stronger range, stronger hand than 6-3 suited, um, but um, not as uh, tight a range as I'd need for against uh, this guy who, with a bigger stack, can call us off lighter. Um, we should, at this stack size, continue to steal the blinds, especially versus weak, tight opponents. Um, just because we get down to the 20 big blind um, mark or even lower doesn't mean that we can't pick up opportunities um, where players in the blinds say are playing very, very tight, uh, look only really getting it in with very, very strong hands. And we can just raise, um, raise their um, blinds um, all day, um, you know, just until they decide to, to adjust and to start, play back in, uh, start playing back at us. Um, suited connectors and Broadway hands um, are good to be uh, looking to, to use in this spot. Uh, just in case you do get flatted, uh, there are some players who, with short stacks, still decide to flat because it's a min raise uh, and then give up um, post-flop. So it's good to have a hand that plays plays uh, fairly well post-flop. And then uh, the final point then with this stack size, adjust if your opponents start moving in over your raises. Um, so you just need to tighten up a bit more um, and look for a hand then that you can you can call um, call a raise should your opponents uh, do that. So average stack strategy then, so say 30, 30 to 35 bigs to 45 bigs, uh, you've got a lot more options. Um, you should be looking to uh, open raise more than three bet. Um, although I put there, three bet can be very effective versus the right stack size. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, I've got another example then, ace five suited. Here we go. Um, so this particular final table, um, we're sitting at the moment comfortably third in chips, um, and there are some, some shorter stacks here. Um, 
and this player is just one below us. Um, and so he decides to uh, to raise, and I think this is a good spot um, to three bet light because it puts him in a uh, spot where he has to commit um, his whole stack uh, on a four bet. Uh, he could flat out of position, and you know we get to play the pot in position, which is great for us. Um, but quite a lot of the time, he will just decide to um, he he will just fold, um, and that's exactly what happens here. Okay. Um, if this three bet doesn't work, um, this player goes up to 42K and we 37K. It doesn't really change things much, but uh, when it works, suddenly we go up to we're up to 48K. This player is down to 30, so kind of becomes more of a, uh, in this this player's range. Um, and we, you know, we are always looking for opportunities to, to pick up chips. Uh, it doesn't involve an all in confrontation, which uh, can create some, some, some real problems. Um, out, especially out of final table. Um, so we should target 20 to 30 big blind stacks. Um, this stack, this guy's stack at the start of the hand was just under 30 bigs. Um, it's a good spot to, um, to put pressure on him. Um, and I've said this in quite a lot of my uh, videos in this series, uh, that we should try and three bet stack sizes that would put them into a sort of uh, four bet or fold uh, position. Um, and this is a perfect example of that. Uh, we should avoid short, shorter stacks who move in more regularly. Um, you know, if we've got 30, 35 bigs and 18 big blind stacks just shoving over us all the time, uh, you know, if we call that, then we're going to be um, short stack ourselves. Um, doesn't mean that we should avoid them completely, um, and especially if they're playing weak tight where they're only getting in, um, as it says here, but target those shorter stacks who are weak tight and will only commit with a very strong range. Uh, you can just raise raise fold versus uh, those stacks all day and just uh, continue to um, steal their blinds. Finally then, big stack strategies, let's say 50 bigs or more. You've got even more options than before. Um, I guess this is why it, you know, it pays to be aggressive before the final table um, because you've got more options. Um, you can take a hit or two without being uh, eliminated at the final table. Um, but hopefully I've, I've given you some ideas of uh, strategies for each of the stack sizes. Um, but with a big stack, you sometimes be able to completely dominate the final table um, as you have a stack that can bust most players. Um, if, you're com if, you know, if you're completely running over the table, um, you can avoid marginal um, plus chip EV spots like all-in all -in confrontations, um, flips, because you just you're having no trouble picking up chips, why would you suddenly risk the majority of your stack on a coin flip? Um, especially at a final table, that doesn't really make sense. Um, so here's an example then, ace queen suited. Um, so we are second in chips at this table. Uh, this player over here has the most chips. Um, but the uh, button decides to open in this spot, and he is currently. Fourth in chips, uh, there are some shorter stacks here as well. So what we would try to do here is to is to generally um, three bet and put pressure on this player um, with the presence of these shorter stacks. Um, the thing is, is that if we know that this player um, is capable, he could be capable of uh, four betting a wider range. Um, and by three betting, we open ourselves up um, to be four bet. Um, so let's just give this example where we do three bet and suddenly he decides to four bet all in and up here we can see oh we only need 42.1 percent equity um if we believe that this player is fairly competent um we can give him a range uh let's say like this and we say oh well we've got 45 percent equity here we only need 42.1% equity to break even uh, in terms of chips. Um, but let's just have a look, look at this for a minute. Let's say 54% of the time, our stack goes down to about 100K. Um, and suddenly we're one of the short stacks. Now, the, I feel at this point, if we knew this player was capable of four betting, um, we almost just, like, essentially turned our ace queen suited into a bluff. Um, and in order to keep in all of the ace and queen hands that we completely dominate, uh, just flatting preflop here um, would be a much better, much better bet. 
Okay, so it's something to, to, to consider just because we think we're getting the right odds against the range of hands this player might choose to four bet doesn't mean that we have to take it, especially if we're sitting comfortably, uh, we're comfortably second here. Um, we've found it easy at this stage. Uh, let's say, for example, we've been three betting uh, this guy to our right quite a lot. Um, then we don't need to necessarily need to take uh, marginal swaps like this. If we're really struggling to pick up chips, uh, we know this player is very, very aggressive. Uh, then this could be a, a, a spot to to call it off. Uh, we're still in the tournament. We're not having to risk our tournament life at this point. Um, and we'll still have, we'll still be, uh, what would it be? Sixth, sixth in chips? No, uh, fifth. So, um, you know, so we're not completely out, out of it. Um, but yeah, just something, something to consider. Um, if you're if you're running over the table, picking up chips all the time, um, then you don't necessarily have to uh, take uh, marginal flip situations, which this definitely is. I mean, that's a that's definitely a, f a flip situation there. Okay. Um, we should three bet light versus um, other aggressive big stacks. Um, so if they're opening a lot and um, recognizing the weak players at the table, uh, we need to put pressure on them. Um, now with a big stack, generally you should avoid clashing with other big stacks. Um, but if you want, you know, there are always going to be uh, opportunities that present themselves for you to pick up chips. Um, and it's important that you uh, you seize on these opportunities. Uh, you may have to adjust if your opponents start for betting you, uh, especially like the example I've just, just given you. Um, you know, maybe it's a better op option to just flat um, rather than have to put yourself in a spot where you have to call off um, in a coin flip situation. Uh, so here's the example then, 9-8 suited. Uh, let's see if we can find it. Okay, here we are. Um, so we're the chip leader at this uh, particular table. Um, definitely, uh, I think I would look to uh, just been raised to steal these uh, these blinds if it folded round to me. Um, it's a good hand to to do this with. Um, we've got the player behind, who um, let's say for example that he is playing particularly weak tight. It's very easy for us if he decides to shove for us to fold our hand. Um, but here in this spot, um, this guy decides to to open, and he is second in chips, um, and we are the only. Uh, a player in the left in the tournament that can knock him out um so we want to be trying to put pressure on him at least so we can um three bet here it's a pretty small three bet um he might choose to to flat here but then we you know we have the added bonus of playing in position and um, the other thing as well is to consider is that um the players behind us um have oh, especially the small blind has a shorter stack uh, so our three bet actually looks quite strong because we're definitely going to be getting the odds to call the small blind uh, if he decides to uh, four bet here, um, so it looks much much stronger to the original razor. Um, if we if we three bet here, because uh, as I said, yeah, we're going to be getting the, the good odds to do it. Sometimes uh, when you do this, um, fortunately the small blind um, wakes up with a hand and decides to um, get it in. Um, that's why it can be quite good um, to th to do this in a particular spot with a suited connector. Um, we're only really hating hating things um, here if we're up against a, an, a higher pair than our um, than the nine. Um, but against a you know uh, unpaired hands, we're doing doing fairly well. And we actually only in this spot only need twenty eight percent, and we have an opportunity here to eliminate an opponent. Um, and if we do call and lose, um, we're still sort of tied for first um, with this player, uh, with the very some other small stacks around. So it's it's um it's a, an important uh point to consider here um is whenever you're thinking about calling uh, chips off what effect is that going to have on your stack size and uh your chances in, in the tournament as you move forward and in this spot um i'm getting really good odds to to call um and t if i call and lose i'm still uh, sort of tied for first place so that's absolutely fine and just to give you an idea uh, 28 percent um so as I said, if we are up against very strong range, okay, then we are uh, we are, we are in trouble. Um, even if we add Ace King, let's see how we're getting on. So we're almost at that point, twenty-eight percent. I think he's um, he doesn't fold Ace Queen in this spot. Okay, and suddenly we're up to thirty percent. 
Um, you know, maybe even king queen suited, maybe ace jack. Um, especially if there's been a uh, he spotted a dynamic where we've been three betting um, this player uh, relentlessly. Um, suddenly, we, you know, we, our equities uh, are much improved. Um, but as I said, is it, even if we call and lose here, um, we you know still do fairly well in the tournament. Also, this might affect um, how we play against this player if this hand shows down, um, because he'll see that we're three betting a uh, suited connector, and he might choose to change the way he's playing against us as well. So we may have to uh, tighten up our hands for three betting, um, but we have greater chance here um, when we do pick up a hand of getting him to, uh, to spaz out, especially if he's seen us um, three bet with a with a marginal hand here, we can. Okay, um, and we can also three bet light versus most stack sizes to force them to commit their tournament life. And uh, this is this is really really important. Um, so we've got a hand here, king jack suited. Um, so here there's four players, four players left. Um, we are comfortable, comfortable chip lead. Um, the this player uh, decide his second in chips decides to open. Um, in this particular spot, um, I could shove um, and put maximum pressure on. Um, Especially with the um, players here, where we've got a 16 big blind stack and a 10 big blind stack. Um, but the other option uh, to consider is just to three bet small. Um, I recognise that if this player that now decides to four bet shove, um, we're going to be getting pretty good odds to to call it off. Um, which is why some handle like King Jack Sudi might be better just to shove um, shove all our chips in uh, to take away that play from this player. Uh, but if we think this player is playing fairly straightforward, then a small three bet here can look um, much, much stronger to this player, and he may well fold um, more more hands in this spot. Um, okay, so that's something else, uh, something else to consider to um, to use use our chips uh, to put maximum pressure on on players, especially when they're he's sort of comfortably second in chips, um, and especially for this player to to go up and close to, to being eliminated. With only 10 bigs and this guy with 16 bigs, um, he's going to fold more often than not. And then look at the final point: continue to steal as before, um, you know, ramping up the aggression, especially as play gets more short-handed. Um, looking to to open up as much as as much as you can. Uh, you will have to adjust at some point as players other players get shorter stacked, and look to three bet um, over your rate. Um, but until that happens, then you should just be looking to relentlessly steal blinds. Okay, so um, quick um, recap of final table play. Um, we should be looking to target specific opponents based on um, our stack size, um, the our opponent's stack size, and also the intentions of our opponents in the tournament. Um, and we can find this information out by using shark scope and OPR. And it's really, really important that you observe your opponents closely um, before the final table. So maybe we're looking at uh, three or four tables before uh, the final table. And then the final point there, we should look at avoiding marginal plus uh, chippy V spots, uh, which might actually be um, a negative dollar EV, um, especially if we get into um, a clash with another big stack when we were a big stack. Okay, um, so that's it uh, for final table play. Uh, this has been Gazelig for GrinderSchool.com. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know um, in the forums. Uh, send me a message on Skype, uh, Gazelig Poker there. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck at the tables, guys. Cheers, take care. See you later. Bye.